why would the brain and the immune system talk to one another? But just believe me for right now that they do. The brain can pick up the red phone, call the immune system, tell it to turn on when it needs to turn on. And the immune system can do a bunch of things that we really care about. And we primarily care about the immune system because what we found is that more than 50% of deaths worldwide today involve inflammation. So most people today, everybody on this call, you likely won't die, hopefully, from a communicable disease. You're more likely to die from an immune or an inflammatory related chronic disease. And so that's the part about why we care about the immune system. And of course, a lot of these disorders um, are stress related. And so putting together the psychology of our experience with the neuroscience of how we experience and appraise stressors together with the immunology that we know drives disease is a perfect combination to try to understand how things that we experience in daily life actually impact our, our, our behavior and our longevity. Hello, and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. This episode is a replay of a monthly webinar I hosted on behalf of CrossFit Health with Dr. George Slavich. We talk about stress and well-being. He's been on the podcast previously, but here we spend more time delving into just how psychological stress can translate into physical illness and answer some great questions from the audience. You can join us live for next month's webinar on February 17th at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 Pacific, with Professor Stephen Rolnick on motivational interviewing for behavior change. Just keep an eye out in the CrossFit email of the day and on CrossFit.com for registration details. Before we dive into the episode, I do want to make it clear that this podcast is for general information only and does not provide medical advice. I recommend that you seek assistance from your personal physician for any health conditions or concerns. So with that, let's get to the episode. Lots of people joining us. I'm seeing some familiar names. So welcome to everybody. I'm excited to get this webinar kicked off. We have a awesome guest here for the month of January, Dr. George Slavich, and I'm going to introduce him in just a moment. Um, but before I do, just some housekeeping items for those of you who have not tuned into one of our webinars before. Um, just for the format, I'm going to spend the first half of the webinar asking Dr. Slavich some questions so he can share with us a little bit about his research. And then after that, we'll be taking audience questions. So you'll notice that there is a Q&A box uh, down below that you can access and enter questions in at any time. So as Dr. Slavich is talking and questions pop into your head, feel free to jot them down there. And then I will present those to him during the second half of the webinar. And no question is too complicated, or too easy. <laughs> Julie has assured me that I'm allowed to take all the easy questions and that she will tackle all of the really difficult questions. So exactly. fire away. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe we should play a game, stump Dr. Slavich and see <laughs> if that's possible. <laughs> Can I call a friend? Uh, awesome. Well, let's get started. So welcome again, everybody, to our January CrossFit Health webinar. I'm excited to be joined today by Dr. George Slavich, and I'm going to introduce him here first. He has quite the bio um, Dr. Slavich is a leading expert in the conceptual, conceptualization, assessment, and management of life stress and in psychological and biological mechanisms linking stress with poor mental and physical health. He's especially interested in how to assess lifetime stress exposure and how this information can be used to reduce health risks and enhance well being and resilience using a variety of evidence based interventions that focus on psychological stress social connection, diet, sleep, and exercise. So I know we can all appreciate that. He's published more than 150 scientific articles on these topics in leading journals, and his work has also been covered by many media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Atlantic, and others. Some background on his education and training. He completed undergraduate and graduate coursework in psychology and communication at Stanford University. And then he received his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Oregon. And after graduate school, he was a clinical psychology intern at McLean Hospital in Boston and a clinical fellow in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. 
After that, he completed three years of postdoctoral training in psychoneuroimmunology, which is a mouthful, and we'll get to later <laughs> um, as he explains what that is at UCSF and UCLA. Uh, he's presently a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at UCLA, the founding director of the UCLA Laboratory for Stress Assessment and Research, and an investigator at the One Mind Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, as well as a research scientist at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. And in addition to all of that, um, in his research roles, he's also extremely dedicated to implementing that research across large populations. And so he serves as a member of a number of networks and task forces and collaboratives, including just two examples. He's the director of the California Stress Trauma and Resilience Network, and he's a co-chair of the APS National Task Force on Stress Management in Primary Care. So that was quite the mouthful, um, but I'm so, so excited to be joined by you today, Dr. Slavich. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Julie. And this is always a pleasure to speak with you. And thank you, everybody out there in the internet ether world for joining <laughs> us. This is, uh, I've just been looking forward to this all week. So. Wonderful. Well, I'm excited, especially about this topic because stress has not traditionally received a lot of attention in the CrossFit community because we seem to be focused on more of those quote unquote sexier topics of exercise and nutrition. Um, and so I would just love to know first what it was that drew you to this field of study to the point that you've really dedicated your whole career to it. Uh, because we all experience it, right? Um, there's this joke that research is research and, uh, <laughs> and I guess I can claim to have fallen into that. I mean, you know, we all go about our lives and, uh, we have good days. We have bad days. We, we fall in love. Uh, we get divorced. We have breakups. We have financial problems. We have windfalls. And um, when all of these happen, when all of these things happen, you feel differently. I mean, you feel good when good things are happening. You feel bad when bad things are happening. So uh, we can all monitor our mood and the way we feel um, when uh, when we have exciting events and also when we feel crappy. Um, but we also know that the adversity that we experience can re can really profoundly impact the way that our brains and our bodies develop, the way that we behave in interpersonal relationships, uh, whether we become addicted to certain substances or not, whether we engage in gambling, whether or not uh, we live to uh, 100 years old or whether we live to 70 years old. And uh, when you think about it, you just sort of assume that, yeah, you know, stress is impacting development and health, and that's all there is to know about it. Uh, but if you want to be a good steward of your own body, I mean, if you want to move past reducing your disease risk and living your best life possible, it makes sense to kind of dive into what's the psychobiology of all of that? You know, how is it that the experiences that you have over your lifetime actually change the way that your brain and your body operate? And how can it be that those changes actually lead to changes in behavior and mood and thoughts and um, biological aging and early mortality, et cetera. So for me, it's a fascinating question because it seems so straightforward, but it's actually very complicated. And then, uh, of course, that's all in the service of trying to understand what we can do about it. You know, so when you study stress, when you understand how stress gets under the skin, that's all in the service of knowing how you reduce and mitigate that stress to live, uh, to live a better life. And that's what I'm really passionate about. Well, we're glad that you're so passionate about it and have done so much work to help all of us understand it better. Um, maybe this is a good time to start unpacking that term psychoneuroimmunology. And you mentioned, you know, how stress gets under the skin. Can you explain for us how a psychological stressor then impacts our physiology? Yeah. Psychoneuroimmunology is a really fancy term for something that's really simple, actually. There are about a hundred, there have been about a hundred people worldwide who are card carrying psychoneuroimmunologists. And that means that they know something about psychology, they know something about neuroscience, and they know something about immunology. And we can sort of reflect even on our own lives uh, about maybe a time, a recent time that was challenging or difficult for some reason. I don't know, let's Let's say you had a really difficult conversation with a boss. 
Uh, you're in that conversation and you have different thoughts that come up. You know, he or she is being difficult. Uh, I'm not coming across clearly. Uh, my job might be on the chopping block. Uh, I don't know how this is going. I don't know what he or she is thinking. I'm sweating. This is not going well, right? The ship is crashing. <laughs> you know, you can catastrophize. You can think that things are going well, hopefully, but you can also sort of catastrophize. So that's the psychology part of psychoneuroimmunology. It's really your appraisal of the situation, uh, how you think it's going. Is the is the situation challenging or threatening? Are you doing well? Is the other person smiling? Uh, is this leading to a conflict, etc.? That's the psychology of the situation. The neuroscience of the situation is how do those experiences of the social environment get represented by the brain? We all have a brain, but we all don't have the same brain. And uh, some brains for different reasons appraise threat differently than other brains. Uh, your brain may be hypersensitive to conflict for one reason or another. My brain may not be, again, for one reason or another that we can talk about. That's the neuroscience of the question. Mm -hmm. You have your experiences with your boss or with this meeting. That's the external environment. But then there's the neuroscience part of it, which is just how is, how is each person's brain appraising that stressor as a challenge versus a threat? Is it going well? Is it not going well? And then the last part is just the immunology. One of the most fascinating discoveries over the past 15 years has been that the brain doesn't just appraise situations in the environment, but it directly, re directly regulates the immune system. And we should also impact why that would even be a thing. Why would the brain and the immune system talk to one another? But just believe me for right now that they do. The brain can pick up the red phone, call the immune system, tell it to turn on when it needs to turn on. And the immune system can do a bunch of things that we really care about. And we primarily care about the immune system because what we found is that more than 50% of deaths worldwide today involve inflammation. So most people today, everybody on this call, you likely won't die, hopefully, from a communicable disease. You're more likely to die from an immune or an inflammatory related chronic disease. And so that's the part about why we care about the immune system. And of course, a lot of these disorders um, are stress related. And so putting together the psychology of our experience with the neuroscience of how we experience and appraise stressors together with the immunology that we know drives disease is a perfect combination to try to understand how things that we experience in daily life actually impact our, our, our behavior and our longevity. That's incredible. And I just want to pick up on that, the, the point you made about chronic inflammation, because I think most of us have heard of that term chronic inflammation. And we think especially related to a diet, maybe high in processed foods or sugar or lack of exercise, or even not getting enough sleep. But can you explain how a, a stressor, like an event, like with your boss can actually lead to inflammation within the body that then can lead to chronic disease, whether it's diabetes, autoimmune disease, heart disease, um, yep. any number of, of chronic conditions? Critical question. And this is your deep dive into human biology or, or immunology for two seconds. And uh, because that's about all I know about it. <laughs> uh, I'm very dangerous in immunology because I'm not an immunologist by training, but, uh, but here's the logic behind it. So we all need to understand what's the primary uh, function of the immune system. And the primary function of the immune system is to keep the body biologically safe. So for example, you might have had a, a recent scrape or a cut on your arm. And if you damage the skin on your arm or anywhere else on your body, you're going to see some redness, some swelling. You might feel a little bit of heat in that area. That's essentially the inflammatory response uh, being turned on, recruiting immune cells from wherever they're hanging out in the body to that site of injury. Now, why the heck would the immune system do that? Well, the primary purpose is to accelerate wound healing and recovery. So the immune system is actually promoting that wound healing uh, process and response. But the other function, why would it do that? Why would it care? Well, primarily to limit the spread of infection, the introduction of bac bacterial products that would get into the body if the body was wounded or viruses, 
uh, in, in the case of some communicable diseases. Now, why would that be a primary function of the immune system? Well, because if the immune system didn't do that and we got a cut on our arm uh, and uh, we didn't uh, uh, accelerate that wound healing recovery, didn't fight off that bacteria, then we could develop an infection that would uh, you know, kill us off in a matter of hours or days or weeks for sure. So now then the question becomes, why would that immune system respond to stress um, and not just to actual physical injuries to the body? And one reason that we think that might have occurred is, is quite simply because the most effective and efficient immune response is one that gets mobilized not just after damage has already occurred to the body, but one that is somehow able to anticipate danger even before it occurs in the environment, or I should say, before the body is actually wounded. And so what happens is that you have these immune cells that hang out in different compartments of the body, like the spleen and the bone marrow and adipose tissue or tummy fat. When the brain detects some kind of threat in the environment, what we think is happening that the brain picks up that red phone, tells the immune system to mount an inflammatory response, which sends immune cells to all compartments of the body, for example, including the arms, such that if that conversation or that fight with your boss or with your spouse actually became conflictual and turned into a fight or some situation where the, you had physical wounding on your body, guess what? Those immune cells are already there. They're already primed and ready and looking for any potential uh, uh, wounding that might occur regardless of whether it happens in the body. And again, you have to think about this from an adaptive perspective. So over the course of evolution, right, millions of years, me, you, other people on the call, those people who mounted that anticipatory inflammatory response to social threat mm -hmm. would have been the same people who would have had the most adaptive wound healing and recovery over time. Or if you think about it the other way, those people who mounted that sluggish immune response that said, oh, I don't know if this situation is really dangerous. I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, we'll just keep the immune cells hanging out in the spleen and the bone marrow. And, you know, if the arm gets cut off or something, then, you know, after we have a cup of coffee or a tea, maybe we'll you know, go and check out what's happening and then kill off a bacteria or two. I say it <laughs> in not going to work too well. <laughs> but you get the point, right? Yeah. Those people who had the second response are likely no longer around us. And so this anticipatory immune response to situations that involved potential conflict, uh, potential arguments, are those types of stressors that we believe are uh, most likely to increase uh, in this innate immune response that drives inflammation. And I'll say one last thing and then I'll shut up, which is your question was about chronic inflammation. So everything I just said is all about the acute inflammatory response to social stress. But as I said earlier, we don't all have the same brains. So some of us can be perseverating about some stress that might happen, even though it's not there. Right? In the example of a boss, let's say that conversation with the boss is on Friday afternoon at three. Well, some of us will show up at 2.55 on Friday afternoon, never having thought about that conversation. Whereas other of us will start thinking about and ruminating about how our boss is a terrible person and always leads to an argument on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And that's how you can understand when the inflammatory response could be acute and time limited when we're not sort of perseverating about negative things all the time versus how inflammation can become chronic just as a just as a function of how we appraise the environment around us so fascinating how i think it it really i think puts things into perspective when you understand that just the quality of your thoughts just having that sort of negative color over things can potentially impact the inflammation happening in your body. Yeah. And you put it perfectly. And all I would say is that it's fascinating because we usually can't feel it happening, mm -hmm. right? We know when our mood goes from okay to upset, 
we know when somebody pisses us off and we know uh, when we're not feeling well. But we don't fully appreciate, I guess is what I'm saying, is that there's a whole biology that gets turned online that we can't directly feel or experience. Mm -hmm. I want to also talk a little bit about um, your social safety theory, which you have recently coined um, and has to do with how these different, um, the different social situations can impact our stress. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Uh, I think as we already sort of scratch the surface, you know, there, and we can all appreciate this in our daily lives, you know, stressors, negative things, adversity comes in lots of different forms, you know, Um, we have financial problems, we have housing problems, we have, you know, encounters with the law, um, uh, you know, interpersonal challenges, etc. So, you know, when you think about sort of the, the beauty of human experience, I mean, there, there's, an infinite number of crappy things that we can experience. Uh, <laughs> but what we found is that they're not all equally predictive of poor health. Uh, when we look at depression, for example, a lot of things can cause depression, but there's something that almost always causes depression, even in people who are resilient, which is really terrible breakup, breakups or divorces, especially when you're the target of that breakup. Uh, so not when you're in charge, but when there's some kind of implication about, uh, uh, you know, your, your quality as a person or whether you're lovable or unlovable, et cetera. Other situations happen at work. For example, uh, you know, you may lose a job. Uh, in some cases, you might lose, lose a job as a function of company-wide layoffs. I mean, that still sucks. Uh, you lose that financial support, et cetera. Uh, but what's even worse than that is getting fired. And why? Well, I think we can all appreciate, you know, the psychology of getting fired is very different than being laid off. When you're fired, there's something impinging on your, uh, on what? On, on how good you are as an employee, on how well you get along with your coworkers. Uh, it kicks you out of that group, you know, your, that tribe, um, just as being divorced or broken up with also kicks you out of that social relationship in a very negative and targeted way. The idea behind social safety um, is quite simple, actually. It's that in order to survive and reproduce successfully, uh, we need to form close social bonds with other people who are friendly, dependable, uh, emotionally warm, supportive, and predictable. Uh, So we think that this goal of securing our own physical safety would have uh, resulted in a human motivation to try to develop and foster a sense of social safety. What does that mean? Trying to cooperate, trying to get along, trying to find other people who are available and dependable and warm. And at the same time, it means generally trying to avoid conflict. Uh, trying to avoid situations where um, there could be an interpersonal argument or opportunities where the relationship might dissolve or heaven forbid, you know, the other person turns angry and attacks us, which, you know, then puts us in physical danger. So that's the idea behind social safety. And there's a whole neuroscience and immunology behind it, which I all already sort of tipped my hat to. But it basically just says that as a human species, we've created this complex world that we all live in because we've developed this capacity to get along, generally speaking, to cooperate, to create systems, uh, to to build buildings, systems of operating policies, uh, ways of organizing ourselves that other animals haven't been able to do. And That is mostly for the benefit, but being kicked out of those groups and tribes therefore poses a risk uh, to health. And it does that, we think, because that experience of threat would mount that immune response that then protects us in the short term, but can be damaging in the long run. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that probably a lot of us can relate to in the CrossFit community because we've seen the power of having that, like you said, dependable, warm, welcoming 
community of people that you um, belong to at a CrossFit affiliate can have on our mental and physical health. Um, and then for some of us too, how much we missed that when we went through a pandemic and weren't able to, to be part of that community for a period of time in person and how um, I think it made us all appreciate that even more when, when we were able to start going to the gym again. That's exactly the thing, right? I mean, 10 years ago, you know, you would have said, oh yeah, you know, it sucks to be lonely. It sucks not to hang out. Uh, but then like the next day you would go out for drinks or coffee with your friends and, or you would go back into the gym or whatever it is. And, you know, that idea of like being socially isolated, maybe if you're a gregarious person, it didn't really apply to you, but then COVID happened. <laughs> uh, right. And now nobody can deny that uh, being isolated sucks. <laughs> and even if you're an uh, extrovert, uh, you probably have still been stuck at home uh, and feeling lonely and feeling disconnected. Um, so this experience of, you know, COVID, the COVID pandemic, I think, has put the importance of social connection and inclusion and belonging on everybody's radar. I think it's been extremely difficult. Um, if you're an extrovert, it's probably been even more difficult. Um, and it's been frustrating. Um, and uh, I think that speaks... Um, uh, exactly to, to what we're talking about here, which is the importance of community, professional community, um, uh, CrossFit community, whatever communities and organizations you belong to, the importance of keeping those alive and well in your life. Absolutely. Well, I want to move a little bit into how we can measure stress because in CrossFit, we're very big on objective data and measurable, observable, repeatable results. And stress is one of those things that can often be very subjective or ambiguous, but you've brought a lot of rigor to measuring stress. Um, so could you talk about that and why it's so important? I think that's so important and cool that CrossFit is all about that. Um, you know, the way that anything um, gets dealt with is with an assessment first, because if you don't assess it, you can't address it. If you can't measure it, you can't move it. I mean, you can't, you can't move the needle, right? If you don't know what the baseline measurement is and then you know what your goals are. And stress is one of the messiest concepts from my perspective because in a lot of other areas of medicine the one of the ways to motivate somebody to change is that you show them what their risk is, you know? If if uh, you go in and you feel something in your breast and and you have that uh, scanned and show, somebody shows you a picture of a tumor, well that's what's going to motivate you. That metric that this is the tumor is this big, it looks like this, this is you know, where it should be, et cetera. Those, those hard metrics is the first step toward being motivated to do anything that's invasive or that takes a lot of motivation. Mm -hmm. Without that, you gotta do it just because you believe what the doctor is saying is gonna be good <laughs> for you, right? Which for right. some of us, that's enough, but for the rest of us, you need some more convincing. And that's one of the biggest problems with stress, right? You say you're stressed, I say I'm stressed, but who's more, more stressed? Is it you because you said it louder? Or I mean, what does that, you know, what does it mean, right? Um, We're all so busy, we all don't have enough time. We're all exactly, yeah, I mean, we all say yeah. that, right? But that's to it, it, that says it all and it says nothing. Mm -hmm. So the objective measurement of stress is critical for two reasons. First of all, it says, what's your risk for poor health compared to normative scores? right? When you say you're stressed, what's the objective assessment? Are, on a scale from one to 10, are you a three, which means you say you're stressed, but you're not really that stressed in terms of an objective metric? Or when you say you're stressed, are you a 10 out of 10, right? We would treat those differently. The second thing is, is, okay, now after you do some action, let's say you start your CrossFit routine, right? You're engaged in it for 2022 and beyond. Now you measure stress on, you know, January 20th. Then you want to measure your stress again on February 20th, March 20th, et cetera, April 20th. You're hoping that that intervention is reducing your stress. But if you're not measuring stress, how the hell do you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not just about assessing your risk related to other people's risk, which is important for motivation, conceptualizing your risk, putting a treatment plan together or an intervention plan or an exercise plan, but you also need to be measuring your progress over. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that because it just makes me think about in CrossFit, our benchmark workouts, we have certain benchmark workouts that we like to repeat from time to time, because otherwise, how do we know if our fitness is actually improving, right? We can just keep doing new workouts all year long, but until we check in and, and measure up 
it's hard to know if what we're doing is actually working. So that's exactly the same way. And I'll just say again, that in a lot of other areas of medicine that has existed for a while, right? You can image things, you can measure them. If you're at risk for heart disease, you might go to your primary care physician and they might give you a a CRP panel, which measures your inflammatory levels. There are clear cutoffs. You're trying to get below generally 3.0, et cetera. So you have cutoffs, you have measurable metrics and you can reduce them. So exactly what you're saying. And I think that's really critical, especially for stress. We all live it, but we need to know how stressed we are and whether we're moving the needle after we engage in something that we think should be beneficial. Absolutely. So speaking of that, let's say we're at 10 out of 10 stress um, and we know that our stress is high and it's a threat to our overall health and well-being. So what are some evidence-based ways that we can then mitigate the negative impacts of stress and build our resilience? My favorite stress busters, I have five of them. (laughs) I love it. I love it. The first one is really focusing on our psychology. Now, we've all have times where we catastrophize or we exaggerate how bad things are uh, and underestimate how good things are. Uh, You know, we have negative thoughts that pop up all the time. And there are a number of tools from cognitive behavioral therapy and other traditions that essentially say, whoa, whoa, whoa. The first thing we need to do is we need to monitor those thoughts. Are you having negative thoughts? Well, some of us know that and, and others of us don't. I know that sounds stupid, but some of us go through the day in a bad mood and don't notice. Mm -hmm. So the first step is really about being mindful of your mood and also of your thoughts. If you're having negative thoughts, one technique from cognitive behavior therapy would be to write that thought down on a paper, examine evidence that supports the thought, examine evidence that doesn't support the thought, and then try to quote unquote, rewrite that thought based on the evidence right? So you might say to yourself, wow, this week is going to shit. Well, that's a pretty (laughs) negative (laughs) and global (laughs) statement. Uh, And in the moment you might feel that way. So then the task is to take a sip, take a step back and really process that thought, examining evidence for it and evidence against it. Like a scientist would do. You almost have to take yourself out of your own mind and say, okay, that's a big negative thought. Let's take a step back. Once you examine that evidence, rewrite the thought in light of what is actually going on. And that's like riding a bicycle. When you first start doing it, it's really hard. It's hard to own the new thoughts, the more balanced thoughts, the more evidence-based thoughts. Um, You might think it, but sometimes you might not really feel it, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Uh, But just like riding a bicycle, if you practice that process over and over again, you will certainly get, get better at it. And eventually it becomes automatic, just like maybe you started and the negative thoughts were automatic without even being aware of them. Yes. And even before that you short circuit the negative thoughts. So the first thing is, is like, you know, if you're the type of person who goes through life and doesn't notice that you're having a crappy day, the first thing that will happen is that you spend less time feeling crappy because you catch those thoughts quicker and you work on them sooner. And then the next step I think that happens is exactly what you said, which is that you don't even have the exaggerated uh, hypervigilant thoughts in the first place. Mm -hmm. All right, so that was one. Yeah, wow, that's like, (laughs) although in three minutes you got a whole CBT lesson. So that's- I know, now we can all go practice. You saved $250 there. Step two is uh, really about social relationships, which we already touched on. And I'm not going to rehash the whole thing, only to say that if you want to get your immune system and your brain to relax, then, you know, move yourself towards situations that involve surrounding yourself with friendly, supportive, predictable, emotionally warm others, Mm -hmm. and move yourself away from situations that involve uh, evaluation, uh, being criticized all of the time interpersonal conflict, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The first one is going to make you feel better. The second one is going to make you feel crappy, but more importantly than how you feel that I care about is that the first one is going to dampen your immune system, reduce inflammation, let you live a longer, healthier life. And the second one is going to drive inflammation, create preclinical disease processes, lead to chronic disease and kill you off sooner. 
We don't want that. We that is bad. If you That's come out, news. if you <laughs> if you learn haven't learned anything else from this webinar, it's that you should stay alive. <laughs> That's right. Yes. And that one step in doing that is just surrounding yourself with people who are positive and welcoming and all those things. And so um I think you know that that quote that you are the sum of the five people you spend most of your time with, I'm sure I'm butchering it somehow, but is so true, right? And it not only is it good for your immune system, but also then you reflect that. So if you're around people who are negative, you're more likely to be more negative. I love it. And that's, you know, that's that sounds like a hokey dokey thing, but what I always say is, have you ever stood next to somebody that was super anxious? You know what I mean? It's like impossible not to be anxious. Almost. <laughs> totally. So, and, and, you know, there are a lot of studies that have actually looked at that scientifically, a lot of interesting studies. Like if you pair two roommates together, they never met each other. And one of those roommates has a lot of negative thoughts. Guess what? Like living together with that college roommate who's really negative makes you more negative. Mm -hmm. You adopt the thinking styles of the people around you. I love the quote. I've never heard of it, but I fully endorse it. <laughs> awesome. All right. So that was two. You have three more. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to rattle these off and then they should become podcasts as separate topics. So the last so three were diet, to sleep, here. and exercise, diet, sleep, and exercise. You should have people on here who are experts in each of those and to continue the conversation about diet, sleep, and exercise. You already mentioned diet. We all know certain diets are more pro-inflammatory than others. Get the pro-inflammatory diets out of your system, move toward whole foods, leafy greens that aren't processed. Sleep, you say, oh, well, sleep, you know, that's important. Well, let me tell you in, from an immune system perspective why sleep is important. When you don't sleep well, you're aroused. I don't mean sexually aroused, I mean sympathetically aroused. Your body is activated. You have a lot of sympathetic nervous system arousal when you uh, don't have a regular sleep schedule or sleep really poorly or have disrupted sleep. The reason why we care about it is that sympathetic arousal can drive inflammation. So if you've ever woken up after a really crappy night of sleep and you felt kind of jittery, it's not just because you're nervous for being nervous. It's probably because your sympathetic nervous system is driving inflammation and your inflammation is making you hypersensitive and hyper aware. Why would that be the case? Well, you have to remember what I said earlier about the function of the immune system to keep you biologically safe. Inflammation drives wound healing recovery, but if you have a wound on your body, you're also compromised, which means that you need to scan the environment for potential threats. So now you put those pieces together. Crappy night of sleep leads to sympathetic nervous system arousal, which drives inflammation, which makes you more threat sensitive and hypervigilant which means that you're gonna wake up and be more nervous, on edge, et cetera. That's the emotional part of it, but the biology of it is that the inflammation is also gonna promote and foster chronic disease. And then the last one is exercise, and I will not pretend to say anything about exercise that uh, everybody on this call already knows about. We but it's good and you that. should do it. <laughs> awesome. Well, that was that was fantastic. I do want to move into some audience questions because we've already got some great, great ones here. But a reminder for those listening, feel free um, to post any questions in the Q&A box so that we can present those to Dr. Slavich. And also, before we get into these, just a reminder that in this webinar, CrossFit's not offering any medical advice. We're not providing any medical recommendations. So obviously, this is a topic that can get personal, but we'll just try to, uh, to answer them more broadly and generally. Um, so first one, which is, I think a great segue from what you just talked about with exercise is from Christine Walker. And she said, are there similar inflammatory outcomes that occur with chronic physiological stress? For example, professional athletes who are constantly under physical stress training for their games. Is there a threshold in which the protective effects of exercise are overwhelmed by overtraining and could this lead to chronic inflammation? Great question, Christine, and thanks for writing. I'm not a stress. I'm not a, a, a physiological stress. Uh, so I'm not an expert on stress physiology as a function of exercise. My best understanding is that uh, you know exercise also can promote wound chilling and recovery. You have an immune response when you exercise. You know muscles are getting damaged. 
uh, immune cells are being recruited and they are um, they're accelerating that um, um, uh, that recuperation of the muscles. Um, uh, but there's also, um, I'm sure, a tipping point where you are causing damage that can't easily be um, restored by a typical immune response. So I think there's the physiology whereby once you damage muscles to a certain extent, you're not going to you're going to over um, overwhelm the immune system's ability to recover um, uh, those muscle fibers quickly enough. But, but that's really what I know less about. What I know more about is that high performance and elite athletes don't just have physiological stress, right? I mean, that's what you think about because when you're done mm -hmm. working out, you feel the pain in your body. But the other, but, and you know, if you're an elite athlete, you're also super resilient. So you don't focus on how the fact that your coach is a jerk, you say, no, the fact that your coach is a jerk or that your teammates are mean is making you stronger. And what I would say is that that psychological activation of the immune response is something that we also need to pay attention to. Now, the fact that you can get through all of those negative, you know, experiences is what is making you resilient, but that doesn't mean that it's not um, also increasing inflammation and having a uh, collateral damage to your body in the long run. And I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we can all relate to team members and coaches who are supportive versus those who are not. Absolutely. Um, I think I'll just pick up on that. When we think about stress and chronic inflammation, there's so many different facets to it. Like you talk, there's the physical stress of training and overtraining. There's the psychological stress, even just the psychological stress of the pressure of training and competing at a high level. But you think about, um, like, I like to think about like your total allostatic load of stress. It's not just, it's physical, it's psychological, it's environmental. When you take into account, you know, your diet, environmental toxins, things like that. And the key is how do we overall balance those out so that they're beneficial and not harmful. Um, and they're always changing. Right. So I think from my personal experience, when I think about training at a high level for the CrossFit games, I was shocked when I finally quote unquote retired and stopped training, how much I realized how much psychological stress I was really under and living with day to day, not just around competitions, but just the day to day of knowing, okay, I have to do my training every day. I have to eat a certain way and always having that in the back of your mind. So I think for, you know, this question talking about high level athletes and, and performers, there's probably a, a trade-off to perform at the, at the very high level. You're making a trade-off there that might not necessarily be what's best for you, you know, longevity wise, physically, um, because you're under so much psychological and physical stress at the same time. But the more you can create a balance by adding more recovery, doing more of, like you mentioned, the, the mindfulness, the CBTI, or no, sorry, not CBT, just CBT, um, to balance that out, um, the more positive impact you're going to have on your health long-term. I agree. Um, all right. Uh, Andrea Matheson says, I live with chronic pain from a few injuries, neck, shoulder, and hip. I'm having a flare up, oh, winter shoveling. Gosh, I feel ya. Um, yep. She said she had a traumatic brain injury a few years ago and is in treatment for PTSD. How does chronic pain contribute to stress in the body? And is it causing more damage or inhibiting my healing? I'm using mobility work, exercise, and meditation for the pain and uh, CPT for the BTSD. Is there a deeper mind body stress relationship? What else should I be doing? So I think, you know, obviously this is a personal situation, but we can answer maybe more broadly about the implications of chronic pain and stress um, and how to uh, potential healing modalities. Yeah. And I think this kind of experience is not all that uncommon, you know, I mean, as we all get older, we, um, we, have more stressors for sure, more responsibilities, more roles that we play. Uh, just when we think, you know, that we've finished the roles of being young, then our parents get older or whatever it is. And then we have those roles to play. So, you know, over the life course, there are a lot of different um, types of stressors that we can experience. Our bodies are also breaking down, uh, you know, well over 78 
percent of people, you know, experience some uh, pain of some sort during the course of their life. And certainly if you had a traumatic event or anything like that happen to you, or if you're an elite athlete, or even if you just exercise regularly, you're going to experience uh, some kind of pain. So this confluence of psychological pain, physical pain, et cetera, is, is, is nothing um, unique. I, I mean, what I mean to say is that it's actually quite common. Um, one thing that we do know uh, relates to this impact of the immune system on our psychological experience of the world. Uh, to the extent to which you have traumatic brain injury or any kind of uh, chronic wear and tear in your body, that would be contributing to this inflammation, uh, those uh, immune cells are gonna release these little guys called cytokines. Um, and those cytokines are, are, are proteins in the body that are really organizing the immune response. But one thing is that cytokines can do is they can interact with neurons. So you have a lot of immune receptors throughout the brain, these cytokines can interact with different neural processes in the brain to make you more threat sensitive. Now, it might be the case that you're stressed out, so your inflammation increases, and those immune cells release cytokines that then contribute to your experience of threat in the environment. So that's sort of like stress is causing inflammation is causing stress, if you follow. Mm -hmm. But you can also have that inflammation, Julia, as you mentioned, from a lot of different other sources. You might have had an injury that's chronic. You might eat really terribly. You might have had chemical exposures. You might be a chronically poor sleeper. Uh, you might be socially isolated all of the time, uh, et cetera. And those are all causes, potential contributors to chronic inflammation that can also feed back on the brain to make you threat sensitive and also to make you pain sensitive. And you might say, well, why the heck would that be? And again, the logic of the immune system is the same. In order to keep you biologically safe, you need to be hyper aware of things around you. And you also need to be aware of, uh, of situations happening in your body. If, you have, uh, if your body is attacked or some, some situation where the body might have been damaged, the heightened pain sensitivity gives you awareness of that. Now that only works when that system is in a time limited fashion, right? That should all happen when the threat is present and it should go away when the threat goes away. But because inflammation can become chronic, that doesn't always turn off like it should. Got it. Well, piggybacking off that question and thinking about um, things to to mitigate um, stress, Ken Moizan asks if you can please repeat the five tips again so he can write them yes. down. <laughs> I think we can all use a, a yes. recap. So number one, psychological stress, I would say, or uh, you know, being hyper vigilant about the environment, catastrophizing, thinking that the worst is going to happen, right? Sort of that exp experiencing things as worse off than they actually are. That's number one. Number two is social relationships, you know, making sure that you're surrounding yourselves, Julie, as you said, by your, what, your five, the five best people, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, emotionally warm, dependable, accepting uh, uh, people. Uh, that's number two, social relationships. And number three, four, and five are diet, sleep, and exercise. Diet, sleep, and exercise. Wonderful. Adam Mick asks a great question that I'm sure a lot of us are thinking about. He said, is there any way to see what a long-term high stress work environment could be doing to your body over time? For example, inflammation or poor digestion. So this is again, back to that idea of how do you measure stress? So all of us experience different stress, but how do we know the degree and when we need to really take action to get ourselves out of a situation or when we can do some of these other things to mitigate and build our resilience. So for 15 years now, I've been developing this system for assessing lifetime stress exposure. And we've validated that system in probably 250 studies or so, if so, uh, so far, we have a lot of published 
work on it. Um, and if a lot of listeners are interested in sort of assessing their own stress, I can, Julie, um, send you some information that you can send out for people who are interested. So that I think is the first step, right? If you've experienced a stress stressors in your life, who of us hasn't? You know, is it, is it kind of high? Is it sort of average for your age? Or, you know, is it low? That for me is sort of the first step toward being able to quantify your lifetime stress exposure. And like I said, I'll, I can send that link and then folks can, um, can check that out. Um, the second thing I think is about the immune system. I and mean, we've talked a lot about the immune system. Um, there are a lot of digital health companies now that will take different biomarker samples from saliva or blood. Uh, I don't uh, endorse any of them in particular. You can search them out. Um, the other thing you can do is you can go to your primary care physician and ask them to uh, assess your uh, C-reactive protein levels or your CRP. If you think you might have some chronic inflammation going on, your CRP levels should be elevated. And that for me would be sort of the first step toward uh, starting a conversation with your doctor uh, or who, any other medical providers in your life to say, yeah, you know, I took my CRP level or had it, I had it taken. Um, by this blood panel that my PCP did, and it's elevated, and I want to understand why. Awesome. Great. Great recap. Um, all right. Well, there's a couple of questions here um, just about specific stressful situations. So Justin Baumgartner asks, what are your thoughts on the emergency response community, which tends to have significant reduction of sleep, rotating shift work and a career of exposure to stressful events. What do we do to support people who are in that role? Very important role. Yeah. And that's one community, but I think we have so many jobs similar to that, that involve low control, terrible sleep, wake cycles, um, a lot of stress, a lot of threat, partly because of the roles that those critical people play, not only are they dysregulating their biology when they're at work, but they also don't shut it off when they're at home. And your question was specifically about how we support people in those roles. And um, I think the main take home message that I would have is that if you have these folks in your life, or if you're in a position to support them in one way or another, help them get to the point at which if they can't change their jobs, at least they can turn their job brain and body off when they're not at their job. And that's, I think, for people who live and breathe their work, whether or not it's a night shift or et cetera, it's, can be hard to shut off. You know, even if you have a nine to five and you love your job at 501, ask yourself, do you shut off your device? Do you close the computer? Do you relax? Do you have a mindful dinner with your friend or your spouse? Do you not think about work? I mean, I imagine few of us can really say, yes, we totally shut off at 501, et cetera. So, I think that's an incredibly important point. And I would say that it's even more important for people who have jobs that disrupt their sleep. It's important that they have joyful, socially connecting experiences during their time away from work that involve relaxing, being mindful, enjoying their lives. But I think that's also important for the rest of us in the typical nine to five. If even if we have a stressful job, we should shut off at 501 and, and put it away and you know, remember that we're sort of, uh, you know, working to live, not living to work. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And very true. It doesn't have to be just a, an overnight shift work situation for people to have that response on all the time and how that is such a, a learned skill now is being able to shut it off or have that stress response, like you said, just in the appropriate time, um, and then be able to, to let it go or turn that that response off physiologically when you're now not sleep in is an situation. Sleep is an incredibly strong driver of inflammation. So if your sleep is disrupted, it's, um, it's a tough thing to overcome. So the shift work, the night shift work is really difficult, but 
suppose what I'm saying is that if you don't have an option, you know, if that's what you do, that's what you do. The best that you can do is at least not think about it and worry about it when you're not there, right? So if you think about sort of it as risk factors or contributors, you want to minimize sleep as a risk factor. But if you can't, at least you can eliminate stress as a risk factor and just live with the fact that you have the sleep risk factor, if that makes sense. You know, these are all levers. All these five things are different levers that you can move to reduce inflammation. And if you can put all of those levers to zero, you know, psychological stress, social connection, diet, sleep, and exercise, if you can master all five of them, then your risk is as low as it can be. But it's better to have one of those elevated than to have four of them elevated. Absolutely. And and whatever you can do to optimize your sleep, maybe you work overnight, but you can still try to do everything you can to get quality sleep when you're not working, um, even if it's you know not in the nighttime hours. It's a challenge for sure, but you mm-hmm. you do what you can do within the confines of life. Absolutely. Um, here's another great question from Karen Thompson. She asks, how do you think about the struggle leading to adaptation versus stress? So obviously stress can be good. It can lead to adaptation, like when we work out and it strengthens our muscles, but there is a point where it can become too much and, and cause damage. So how do we help to find what that, that right balance is? One thing we know is that the physiology of challenge is totally different than the physiology of threat. So if you go in to, I'll use the psychological example. If you go into a salary negotiation with your boss and you think to yourself, yes, this is an opportunity to make sure that my boss knows about all of the things that I did this year to make our team succeed, all of the deliverables I achieved, all of the benchmarks that I hit. This is a chance for me to educate my boss who might not know about all of those things how much I contributed, uh, then that then you're going to experience that situation as a challenge, a challenge to overcome. Uh, similarly, or I should say on the flip side, you can experience that entire situation, as I mentioned earlier, which is that this is an opportunity for my boss to find out how lazy I've been. Uh, you know, I'm never going to get a raise. Uh, you know, this is going to go poorly, et cetera. We don't have time to go into the details of it, but what I want to say is that the physiology underlying those two different experiences is very different. The second experience of going into those situations, those workouts, those conversations, those encounters that we have and viewing them as a threat is going to prepare your body for wound healing and recovery. And that's good if your body is actually damaged, right? But how many times do we go in and, you know, get physically attacked by our boss, right? Like in the contemporary social environment, that doesn't happen often. Now, I say that because that means that we're sort of experiencing that situation as threatening and mounting an inflammatory response when it's not needed. And that's sort of collateral damage for no benefit, if you will. And that's what we want to avoid. That's great. And as you were saying that, I was just thinking of a popular CrossFit workout that everybody knows called Fran. And I think about, okay, there's two ways you could approach it. Right. And I think a lot of people can relate. They see, oh man, the workout's Fran today. So all day you're at work, you're thinking about it. You're nervous. You're thinking, oh my gosh, I I really want to be able to do better than I did last time. You, You can think about it as a challenge. Like, oh, I'm so excited to see how far I've come. I'm so excited to, to see if I can beat my score from when I did it six months ago. Or you could think, oh gosh, it's Fran. It's going to hurt. It's going to be terrible. I'm going to do so bad. Like, I don't want to go. You can really see it as a threat. Um, And just thinking about, okay, how your thoughts are throughout that day and how you approach it can impact then the inflammation that is sort of um, stewing in your body or preparing you for that workout. Yeah. And, you know, um, there are so many great examples of how, you know, your entire behavior, not just your biology, but your behavior changes when you approach things as, um, as challenges versus threats. And, uh, you know, a lot of the Olympic, uh, you know, world records, et cetera, were, uh, you know, are broken after somebody else broke it. Right. I mean, why, why is that the case? Um, high jump record, et cetera, you know, uh, you know, that's partly because people saw it done. They feel like they can do it. 
And all of a sudden, they're able to muster a, an amount of confidence, energy mobilization uh, to overcome and to do something that they weren't able to do before. So, you know, it's not just this difference between inflammatory biology versus not, but your entire potential, you know, whether or not you can beat the record, you know, the high jump record depends on your mindset. And, you know, it depends on other things too, but but a part of that is mindset. And it's not just the mindset that guard that drives your behavior, but also that drives your biology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we, we see that in the CrossFit community for sure. I think all of us can relate to, you know, seeing someone get a new skill in the gym and then now you believe you can do it and you get it. Or so many people that have gotten their first muscle up or their first double under in the open, because now it's something that's this challenge that they're going for. Um, and so it's, it's just cool to think that it's not only our performance that can be affected, but also our biology, um, and the impacts that it has on our health. So. Yeah. And what I would say is support yourself and support each other. You know, that's mm -hmm. how we'll, uh, that's how we'll all get further, faster and healthier. Beautiful. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. We're right at time. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Slavich, um, for people who want to, read all of your research papers or follow the work that you're up to in your lab, where can they get a hold of you? We'll send out a notice if that's okay. We're um, regarding the stress assessments um, online, uh, this website called Google search engine, George <laughs> Slavich, uh, lab website at UCLA, UCLA stress lab, all one word, UCLA stress lab.org, UCLA stress lab.org. You'll find it there. Perfect. Awesome. And then for those of you who are still tuned in, a couple of quick announcements. There is still time to register for the CrossFit Health Conference, which is happening this weekend. It's Friday the 21st and Saturday the 22nd. We're hosting a virtual event that's going to bring together world-class experts to discuss the latest research and advances in areas from nutrition to mental health, injury treatment and prevention, genomics, and more. And anyone's welcome to attend, but our healthcare professionals, uh, physicians, and CrossFit level three trainers will be able to earn CME and CEU credits. And you can register for that at conferences.crossfithealth.com and also see the full lineup of presenters. Um, so that's all I have for this month. Next month, you can join us for our webinar, which will be featuring Professor Stephen Rolnick on motivational interviewing for behavior change. And that's February 17th at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. So thank you again, Dr. Slavich. And thanks to everybody who tuned in. My pleasure, Julie. Always great to see you. And I wish you all all the best. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people.